Since the Tar Heels beat Duke in round one, the Blue Devils have been on a roll. What's been allowing them to do that, and how can Carolina shut it down? We're going to go behind enemy lines and find out. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Friday, March 8th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you've joined us at the place to get your Tar Heels content every single day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch. Special shout out to all you everydayers out there. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. It is a double episode Friday, and on this episode, we are going behind enemy lines with Locked On Blue Devils host J.J. Jackson, who does a great job covering Duke. He's going to tell us what we need to know about Duke and what's been going on since the first time when these two teams met up. Let's get right into it. J.J. Jackson and Isaac Shade here with you for a North Carolina and Duke crossover as we wrap up the regular season. We wouldn't have it any other way than these two schools meeting for yet another top 10 matchup. It's electric as always. JJ, the Blue Devils, the Tar Heels both seem to be rolling right now, both right at the top of the ACC and in the conversation for a top two seed in the NCAA tournament. It's great stuff. We wouldn't have it any other way. A meeting back inside Cameron Indoor Stadium to wrap up the regular season for the first time uh, for these two schools since Coach K's final regular season game that it wraps up there inside Cameron. And look, JJ, since the last time these two teams met, Duke is on a roll. Winners of eight of the last nine since then. And that's where I want to start. What is it for Duke that's really picked up since that last, uh, since round one between the Blue Devils and Tar Heels? It's been a lot of fun to watch. I'll tell you that much with the Stoop team in particular, uh, because you're right. You felt as though after the loss to North Carolina in Chapel Hill, that the odds of being in a regular season championship conversation, were going to become slim. But North Carolina had a hiccup or two along the way. And for the most part, (laughs) outside of that uh, Wake Forest game, Duke has been, you know, rolling and playing really good basketball. I saw some numbers earlier this week. Uh, Since then, Duke has been the number five team in the country with their offensive rebounding rate. They've been number two in the country and two-point field goal percentage. They continue to lead the ACC and three-point percentage. So, uh, I mean, in that first meeting, we saw Duke score over 80. We saw North Carolina hit the 93-point mark. I mean, both teams have played some pretty good offense this year. And I would say, really, over the last nine, it's been that Duke offense just going to the next level and really playing some impressive basketball and keeping them in games. Man, that's good. And and one of the unfortunate things that's happened lately is that, JJ, we know that Caleb Foster's out now. And I know he's not part of the starting five, but man, played a critical role there in, in the backcourt with some backup minutes. How has that affected the rotations for Coach Shire? Uh, big time. And, and Coach Shire would tell you that Duke doesn't have a starting five. He'd tell you that Duke has six starters because you look at the injuries so far this season. Foster's missing time right now. But he hasn't even missed as much time as Jeremy Roach and Tyrese Proctor had combined earlier in the season in that backcourt. So it's had to kind of be plug and play amongst those six players when you're talking about Roach, Proctor, McCain, Foster, and then the two bigs and Mark Mitchell and Kyle Filipowski. So other guys have just gotten a little bit more of an extended run. You hate it for Caleb Foster because he was so level, so steady. You look at those freshman guards for Duke, Jared McCain is on a meteoric rise, whereas Caleb Foster has just kind of been steady and casually progressing throughout the season. So a big loss that he's not available right now for the Duke basketball team and really not a very clear timetable as to when, if at all, he'd be able to come back this season. And hopefully he will. We never want to see these young men miss some games. And so hopefully uh, Foster can certainly get back on the court. JJ, one of the things I'm curious to ask you about is in the first matchup between these two schools, Armando Baycott had a day, a very efficient day, 10 of 13 from the field. Uh, You know, we saw it earlier in the week, a a great win for Duke at NC State. But DJ Burns had the game of the season for him personally. 
And I think that's one of the key matchups we're looking at here is what do you think Duke will do in the in the front court to try and slow down Armando Baycott? Do you think Coach Shire will just kind of roll with the same game plan? Do you think he'll throw some defensive wrinkles at Baycott? How, how do you see that playing out? I think that, uh, yeah, in, in some ways, it'll be a little bit of both. I think you could see a little bit of the same game plan in terms of focusing more so on what R.J. Davis does for this North Carolina team. Because in that first meeting, for the majority of the game, R.J. was rather inefficient when the likes of Tyrese Proctor and Foster were out there defending him. And it was Armando Baycott who was having his way on the inside against NC State earlier this week and over the last few games with Foster out. Another freshman in Sean Stewart has gotten more playing time. T.J. Power has also been in the mix as well. But Sean Stewart proving to have such a valuable role as a post player for this Duke basketball team. A lob threat, a career high in points earlier this week against NC State. He rebounds pretty well for his size. The dude broke Zion Williamson's vertical jump record as a freshman at Duke. So he is an absolutely outstanding athlete. And I think he deserves an opportunity to play a little bit more in a game like this because Let's face it, Kyle Lepowski has been prone to foul trouble, and that was something that kind of got after him in that first game, and then you're relying a little bit too much on Mark Mitchell and Ryan Young to get the job done. So I think it's a by-committee approach, but for Duke, I think you are okay with getting a little bit more from Armando Baycott than if, say, R.J. Davis goes off and leads the way for the rest of the team. 100%. I, I, lo- I loved that recipe from Coach Shire in round one of trying to slow down R.J., getting some length on him with Tyrese. I thought I thought it was a great game plan, and you got to think that that goes better. And, J.J., I wanted to ask He's you about – math, Isaac, right? Three, <laughs> three points are greater than two. The Wait, is that points... how that works? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's oh, crazy. my gosh. I've been struggling with numbers my whole life. I'm so glad to know this. <laughs> no, very seriously. I mean, you look back at the box score from the first game, Sean Stewart, a minute 52 played, uh, zero point, you know, zeros across the box score there. And from the outside looking in on Duke's program a little bit, man, it, it's been interesting to see him coming on, his athleticism being unlocked a little bit. You think back to last year where he had flip at the four and an imposing Derek Lively at the five. I mean, are are we seeing some times where both Stewart and Flip are out there together kind of playing that 4-5 combo? Without a doubt. I think that's going to be a look that Duke goes to here down the stretch. I also think you see uh, kind of a Mark Mitchell and Sean Stewart front Ooh, as well for this Duke basketball team. Stewart's role is going to greatly uh, improve and increase throughout the remainder of the season. I think he has earned those minutes, and he just brings an entirely different level of athleticism to the Stoop team. You can't have enough lob threats at the rim right. when you've got the guards that Duke has trying to drive and throw it off to somebody to finish. Let me ask you about those guards because, JJ, one of the things from last time, Kyle Filipowski, 22 points. Jared McCain, 23 points. Jeremy Roach, 20 points. Mark Mitchell had 11, but it was a very efficient 11, four of six from the field. But the weird outlier to me was Tyrese Proctor, just one of six on the day, uh, only two total points, two assists. You got to figure he's going to get unlocked in this game and not have that same kind of performance. JJ, what does John Shire need from Tyrese Proctor in this game? Well, and Isaac, I could tell you, I, uh, Tyrese Proctor heard about it from that first performance <laughs> that he had against uh, North Carolina. John Shire immediately after the game kind of talking about uh, the effort and energy that Duke played with early in that game, which is pretty wild to think about when we talk about all the exciting matchups that this rivalry has produced over the years. But this is the same Tyrese Proctor whose energy led Duke in picking up a couple of victories last season against North Carolina. I've still got the images in my head of him exiting the Smith Center, waving goodbye to the crowd after Duke won the basketball game, right? And ever since then, he has really stepped up. Tyrese Proctor's jump shot is coming back as of late like we used to uh, seeing it a year ago. I mean, he is just such a remarkable basketball player. And at 6'5", handling it, getting it into Duke sets that they want to run, plus the outside shot that he's got, I mean, he is definitely uh, the reason this Duke team will go. And I, I really do expect him to bounce back on Saturday. It just doesn't feel possible that he's a non-factor in both UNC games this year. 
Yeah, I don't see that either. And I think that's probably one of the things that has a lot of Tar Heel fans concerned is seeing how Proctor will turn it around. Speaking of Tar Heel fans, they want to hear a little bit about the Carolina side of this, how the Tar Heels are going right now. I'm sure Duke's interested to hear how the Tar Heels have been doing since the last matchup. So we're going to switch chairs and coming up here in just a second, JJ is going to grill me a little bit. And we'll have that conversation in just a second, right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV, which is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug right into your existing TV to provide access to millions of TV shows and movies. Personally, at the Shade House, I literally have an Amazon Fire Stick on every TV we own. I love the layout and user experience. The remotes are great. Here's one of them right here. I've got a button for Prime Video and Netflix and Disney Plus and Hulu. JJ, it's incredible. Fire TV recently even created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free, including all of us here at the Locked On Network. Not to mention that Amazon channels have great news and entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. So folks, come on, check out the Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't done so, you should. Trust both JJ and I on that. To learn more, visit amazon.com slash LockedOnFireTV. And welcome back into another Locked On crossover here today. It's Locked On Blue Devils and Locked On Tar Heels. J.J. Jackson from the Duke side of things. Isaac Shade is with those UNC folks talking all things Tar Heels each and every day of the week. Round two between Duke and UNC. This time the stage is set for Cameron Indoor Stadium. I think, funny enough, both teams come into this game with an identical overall record. Both teams 24-6 and six overall through the first 30 games, and now an ACC title is on the line for Duke. North Carolina can take it outright going into the game on Saturday. Since we last spoke, since that first win of North Carolina, it's been rather up and down at times, Isaac. Kind of walk us through where North Carolina has been since that first meeting in Chapel Hill. Absolutely, JJ. So let's even go back one game before that, because Carolina went through this win-loss, win-loss, win situation where leading into the Duke game that first time, they lost at Georgia Tech. Who? How about Damon Stoudemire in year one, man? He is like, I know they don't have a great overall record, but they, they got something good brewing down there in Atlanta. It's good for our conference to see that. And then the win over Duke, immediately Carolina goes out and undoes all of that by losing at home to Clemson for just the second time ever. Then they went to Miami and won and then flew all the way up to the northernmost part of the ACC and lost at Syracuse. So it was this weird stretch of losing three games out of five uh, as Carolina's defense, which had helped them so much in the 10 game losing streak or 10 game, excuse me, winning streak before that, then went through that stretch. Since then, the Tar Heels have won five games in a row. The defense has started to come back around, have held three of their last four opponents under a point per possession, including having their way against Notre Dame at home earlier this week, which you expect to do, although Notre Dame has been playing much better of late. Speaking of ACC teams not expected to do much that have made a little bit of a run. So the Tar Heels come into this Duke game on a five-game winning streak. As you said, a, an overall uh, identical record to the Blue Devils. And so, JJ, it, it's just perfect. Like, I know that one team has to win and one lose, but you just love to see both of these teams at the top of our conference. We'd have it no other way. Duke has a win earlier this week against NC State in Raleigh on the road the last time out. You mentioned prior to the first meeting, North Carolina had lost to Georgia Tech. Well, it's not a loss that Carolina's riding high off of. Instead, or I guess they weren't riding high off through the loss. You know what I'm talking about there. Riding uh, very low off of that yeah, one. <laughs> Instead, they are riding high now as uh, Senior Day came and went for the likes of Armando Baycott and uh, R.J. Davis, among others with that Tar Heel team. And what a dominant performance against the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. JJ, it, it really was. And one of the big things that I'm always watching for on senior days is how do guys handle the emotion of that, which is going to be very true of our game here on Saturday as well, frankly, for both teams, if we're being honest. Um, but, you know, RJ Davis had a game for senior night where he just keeps 
doing that. But Carolina had, interestingly, a very balanced scoring approach, kind of similar to the first Duke-Carolina matchup where RJ Davis was the third leading scorer um, for that team. But Baycott had 14 points. Harrison Ingram, similar to how he did in the first Carolina-Duke game, had a double-double, 11 points, 14 rebounds. So a lot coming from a bunch of different guys in that Notre Dame win. There was a 16-0 run out of halftime, an 18-0 run later in the second half. And it was one of those games that you really get, you like it from a standpoint of no Tar Heel played more than 31 minutes in that game. So you're able to get off your feet, kind of preserve a little bit of getting banged up and stuff heading into this rivalry game tomorrow. So we're talking about the game and matchups are something that we focus so, so much on in a game like this, and rightfully so. Uh, we mentioned from the North Carolina perspective, you're probably not feeling as great that Tyrese Proctor didn't play well in the first game because the law of averages mean he's going to step up. The same could be said, however, for R.J. Davis. How vital is it for him to play well if North Carolina wants to go into Cameron Indoor Stadium and walk away with a win? It's a great question, JJ. And, and interestingly, that putting Proctor on RJ became a little bit of a blueprint that a lot of AC teams have em employed throughout this season. Um, I'll go back to last Monday night when Carolina hosted Miami and Miami, much like as I would do, put Matthew Cleveland on RJ Davis to bother him with some length. And he scored a Smith Center record 42 points. So RJ has been finding ways to kind of get unlocked a little bit, even, even with some of that height and length on him. One of the interesting things is that in that first game, Carolina was able to win even without him going off, we'll, we'll say. And so that's the critical thing for me is that RJ Davis is a superstar who doesn't mind finding other ways to impact a game, even if he's not the one pouring in all the points. So for example, he has five or more assists in six of Carolina's last nine games. He's been uh, helping on rebounding a lot. He had a block shot the other day as a six foot nothing guy. And so I think it's one of those kind of things the Tar Heels are finding is if it's an RJ game where he's going crazy, let's get him the ball. If it's not and Proctor's really bothering him, AJ's going to, or RJ, excuse me, is going to look to be more of a facilitator getting Baycott involved or Harrison Ingram, as happened in the first game, who just had a crazy five of nine day from three. Um, so those are kind of the things I'm watching. How does Duke guard RJ Davis? And then is RJ finding some openings to score? And if not, how is he working as a facilitator? Let's talk about the defense and offensive picture for this game in particular, and then we'll take one more time out. We've got the ACC tournament seating that's on the line, the NCAA tournament picture at large, right. and so much more we'll be able to discuss in that final segment of today's show. But looking at this game and looking at Duke basketball over the last month or so, in seven of the last nine games that Duke has played this season, they've hit at least nine three-point shots they are really heating up. They're the best three-point shooting team in the ACC by a makes and percentage standpoint. Duke only made five of them in that first meeting, and we actually had this conversation prior to round one because North Carolina had been so good at defending teams on that three-point line. How big of a factor is this going into Saturday night's game, and how do you think this could play out? Because Duke's kind of figuring out how to make those shots from the outside and North Carolina, got to make sure you defend it as well. That's right, JJ. It's that same law of averages conversation we just had about Tyrese Proctor, where it's like, oh, Duke only hit five in the first round, but they are 13th in the nation at hitting 38% of their three-point field goals. Meanwhile, Carolina's three-point defense is 31st in the nation, only allowing 31. So whichever team can be closer to their season average, I think is well in the driver's seat to win this basketball game. Because as you said earlier, in the craziest math statement I've ever heard, three points are more than two, uh, JJ. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the beyond the arc factor is critical in this game because again, not to mention Carolina, while they didn't get up to double digits, they did get kind of an unexpected uh, three-point performance from Harrison Ingram in that first game. So that's kind of the thing that's at play is does Jared McCain go a little bit wacky from three in this game, which would not be shocking in any way? Does Tyrese Proctor pouring him in? Is Kyle Filipowski pouring him in? He was only one of six in that first game. So I, I think um, the defense beyond the arc for North Carolina is where you may see this game won or lost. Big time matchup coming up Saturday night, 6.30 p.m. Eastern on ESPN, of course, 
College Game Day live from Durham on Saturday morning. It is going to be an absolute blast, and uh, we certainly appreciate you listening to this Locked On crossover. Let's talk about the ACC tournament coming up next week, the postseason, and other X factors ahead of the big game. And we'll do that after one more timeout here on this episode of Locked On Blue Devils and Locked On Tar Heels. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to make sure that you have access to the best quality professionals and candidates around. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. They've got a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. You want to be a part of that number as well. Go ahead and post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we're wrapping up Locked On crossover here today between the Isaac Shade-led Locked On Tar Heels bunch, <laughs> myself, the J.J. Jackson-led Locked On Blue Devils bunch, last game of the regular season. It's funny, I was talking throughout the week with those loyal Blue Devil listeners, Isaac, about the fact that we spend so much time throughout the offseason getting ready for this college basketball year that we love so much, and all of a sudden there's just one. Dude. One regular season game left, and of course, it's the greatest rivalry in the sport. It, it, and, and JJ, it's so wild because I know that our sport is a long one, but it still feels like it just flies by. Like <laughs> November sixth or whenever the season started, okay. feels like just yesterday in some respects, but feels like eight years ago in others. And so, man, I just I don't know what this is going to look like going forward with conference realignment and all that stuff. So I just want to say to both of our fan bases, like, y'all, we got to enjoy this while we definitely still have it because we don't know what's going to happen in the next several years. So let's soak in every moment of what is so special about every time these two teams get together. And of course, this year, it's a championship that's up for grabs for both of these teams, right? North Carolina will claim a share of the ACC. I've always loved the fact that, hey, you're co-champions. You are a champion regardless, no matter what you look at it, no matter how the win-loss records go uh, and head-to-head and that sort of thing, you get to claim your championship. However, once it comes to the tournament the following week, we can't have two teams be the number one seed, Isaac, or else our bracket makes no sense whatsoever. So uh, the, the number one seed line is definitely up for grabs. It is fun. And and just thinking about the regular season championship itself, you know, when, when you're the team that has the opportunity for the outright you don't want to wind up with a tie as people always joke about. It's like kissing your sister or whatever. And so, uh, you know, I know for the Tar Heels, it's like, man, really want to get that outright championship and and keep Duke from doing that. And I know for Duke, it's like, man, if we could slide in and grab a share of that, how how good would it be to rankle the Tar Heels? And so uh, I think that's a really fun aspect of this. But you're right that that one seed is on the line for the ACC tournament. And if Duke wins this game, you know, we get that wacky tiebreaker scenario in the ACC where I know some conferences have like margin of victory in the, in the two head-to-head games as their tiebreaker. For us, we're going to be looking at if Duke wins uh, the, the winning percentage against teams on down through the ACC standings. Um, and so it's funny because both teams were perfect against Virginia. And so it probably is going to go to whomever is fourth and uh, Duke has the advantage if it's Clemson or Syracuse. North Carolina has the advantage if it's Pitt or Wake Forest. So there's a whole bunch at stake here in these tiebreaker scenarios. We've been telling people uh, from the Duke side of things, we're rooting for the orange team, right? <laughs> because Syracuse and Clemson really help us out when trying to get that one seed. The other options, not so much with Duke falling uh, in a couple of those games to Wake Forest and Pitt. That's great. I love <laughs> it so much. It's going to be a uh, uh, epic ACC tournament, no matter who's the one and two seed um, in that in that scenario. And, and JJ, before we get to the final sides of our game tomorrow on Saturday, while we're talking tournaments, I, I like as we look at the prognostications for both the Blue Devils and Tar Heels um, at the national level, obviously we've got 
Houston, UConn, and Purdue basically locked in to those top three one seeds. But that fourth one seed is very much still in play. It seems to me like Tennessee has the inside track on it because they've been handling their gauntlet of an SEC closing schedule really well. Arizona's in play, which is funny enough with the Caleb Love factor of all that for both of our two schools. Um, it seems like Iowa State might still be in play if they could somehow um, rise up above Houston and win that Big 12 championship. But JJ, I think both our teams feel very good about the possibility of a one seed should they win on Saturday and then go on to win the ACC tournament. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you got to have a lot of magic happen next week in Washington, D.C. with that ACC tournament as well. I, I think just looking at it, it's a little bit easier for North Carolina to mm. get to that one seed than it is for Duke. Considering where North Carolina has been throughout this whole season, Duke has fallen a little bit. They're playing really good basketball in March. John Schreier now 51-15 and 15 in his first 66 head games as a head coach at Duke. The best start ever. I mean, watch out for what this guy is building in terms of a team year in and year out. But just looking at can you get to that one seed line, I think it would take Duke running the table the rest of the way, including an ACC tournament championship win for the second straight season. And then, yeah, maybe a slip up from – Tennessee or in Arizona along the way to make the picture a little bit more clear. That's what right. about you? I, well, first off, I love what you said about Coach Shire there. I love that both of our new coaches are having great seasons. I think <laughs> it's just great for the, for our rivalry and for the ACC itself without the figureheads of Coach K and Coach Roy and Coach Smith prior to that. And so I think it's good for us. But yeah, I'm with you. And honestly, I think the Tar Heels are probably in the same boat of needing to um, win Saturday, and then if if not winning outright the ACC tournament, at least getting to the championship to have hopes of a one seed. And another factor is Charlotte is one of the host sites for the first two rounds, and both our teams have a great shot at landing there as well. So we'll keep our eyes on that um, that landing site for the NCAA tournament. Absolutely. Really excited to see how this all plays out. Again, the one seed and the ACC tournament on the line, and can you get a one seed spot? in that NCAA tournament, and and Charlotte is the perfect destination for both of these teams to be playing right there at home. we got to get to the game. we got to get to uh, our final thoughts here ahead of Saturday's contest between Duke and North Carolina. Let me give a shameless plug as well to the content that we saw released by the mothership That's last right. week. <laughs> the rivals reunited. If Duke and North Carolina fans did not get a chance to watch that hour-long show where West Durham sat down, with Coach K and Roy Williams. While we're talking about the current head coaches, you've got, I mean, that was just absolutely incredible right. to see those two guys together reminiscing on how great this rivalry has been. JJ, it's been fun. I've had a lot of Carolina people reaching out to me. I don't know what you've heard and saying, man, I, I really hated it because it humanized Coach K a little bit. And I oh, kind of, <laughs> have you heard some of the same things? And uh, yeah, so it's just been, I look, while I appreciate the rivalry and like, oh, I don't like that coach, like, they're humans like you and I are. And, and it's just good to see that side and all the high school coaches there um, in attendance. And I just, what a great thing for our sport to get that kind of that that kind of notoriety. I took us on a detour there, Isaac. Steer <laughs> us back straight. Let's set up this game one final. Let's time. do it. Here's what here's where I want to go very next, JJ, as we get to wrapping it up. One of the critical things, and I think we talked about this last time, is I love these games because somebody unexpected always rises up to do something unexpected. Who do you think is that X factor for Duke? It's a great question. We talked a lot about Sean Stewart uh, and what he's been able to do for Duke over the last few weeks. Part of me wants to throw someone out there like TJ Power, even Isaac, for what he could do with the outside shooting in particular. He's an absolute marksman, large at six foot eight, six nine out there on the wing for this Duke basketball team. Similar in like Seth Trimble had a lot of really big plays and, for North Carolina in the first meeting. Uh, but, no, I, I think, honestly, we're due for a Jared McCain game once again. Uh, he's been an absolute star this entire season. He played incredibly well in Chapel Hill the first time around. This very well could be his final game in Cameron Indoor as NBA teams come calling. And right. the way he's able to kind of fire up and motivate and energize not only his team but the crowd, opposing fan bases, everything. He's just such a mesmerizing basketball player. And uh, I, I think he's the pick there on the Duke side of things. 
I'm going to go with a freshman for the Tar Heels. You know, a lot of Carolina's guys have experience in this environment from R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott, who were starters in Coach K's final home game. You've got a Cormac Ryan, who has played in Cameron. You've got Jalen Withers coming off the bench, who has played in Cameron. Harrison Ingram, who has not played in Cameron, but uh, in critical big games. I think Elliot Cadeau's role in this game as the lead guard for yep. the Tar Heels, how does he handle the pressure? He's been in massive big games before from high school, playing for the Swedish national team, for those who are unaware. But his ability to handle the, the emotion and the crowd of Cameron Indoor Stadium, I think could be a critical thing for the Tar Heels. So I, I'm watching for how Elliot Cadeau handles this moment. I love it. I think we've talked a lot about the guards going into this game. We've talked a lot about those for Duke, and we talked about R.J. Davis and Elliot Cadeau, meanwhile, sitting there just like, what about me? I've been great all year. I, I can still make plays in a game like this. So, uh, yeah, Duke definitely needs to be aware of Cadeau on the scouting report. That's, that's absolutely true. So, J.J., what's the final word? What happens? Yeah, once again, like I said last time, really hard to pick against my squad going into games like this. Uh, but I don't the, the power of Cameron Indoor, right? And unfortunately, we didn't get that power the last time around <laughs> in Coach K's final home game as the head coach uh, for the Duke Blue Devils to close out the year. Uh, I think Duke's able to get the job done. I think it is a very close and competitive game. Duke has had a lot of fairly lopsided victories. As of late, so Duke fans, be ready. We're in for a nitty-gritty one once again. But at home, I think that's just such a big advantage. And the three-point line, I think, once again, is going to be a big difference. And I don't know that North Carolina is able to make as many to keep up with Duke in this matchup. Yeah, that could very well be how this plays out, JJ. For me, I'm looking, speaking of two initials, one of whom ends with J, I'm expecting a tight game that comes down to it. Carolina's loss at Georgia Tech. Carolina ran a great play to get RJ Davis a look for the win. Uh, we thought there was a foul that happened. It wasn't called. I'm looking for something similar to happen in, in this game where it's very tight right down to it. R.J. Davis gets a runner off the glass to send Carolina back to Chapel Hill with the walk-off victory. I know that's a crazy prediction, but how wild would it be uh, to kind of wrap up the regular season and get the outright championship that way? Give me Carolina 81-80 to 80 with that R.J. Davis layup. I love scoring points. That'd be a heck of a game to watch. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's hope that that happens, man. I know we're going to be dialed in. Again, 6.30 p.m. Eastern on Saturday. Can't get here soon enough. It cannot. JJ, it's so great to be together as always. Best of luck to the Dukies and the Tar Heels. We'll see how this plays out and get ready for some ACC tournament action next week and beyond. I know we're going to be rivals in this one, but man, I cannot wait for what happens the rest of the season. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Isaac, always great to do these crossovers with you. And for all we know, we could have a great game on Saturday. And then maybe, just maybe, Eight days later, we'll see another one in the ACC tournament. You just never know with these two schools, man. Big thanks to JJ Jackson for joining me to help break down round two of the Carolina Duke matchup this season. If you haven't subscribed already to the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, you're missing out. Come for the Tar Heels, stay for that community. The link is in the show notes. It's free to join. Do it right now so you don't miss out on a moment of the action during the game tomorrow. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube and audio, man, it's free to do as well. Just hit that subscribe button as you're watching on YouTube. And while you're there, smash the like button so we know you're here. Ring the bell so you get notifications when we go live tomorrow after the game. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be right back tomorrow after the game with our live postcast. Don't miss it. But until then, peace. Peace.